Today, we're going to examine would the Lucy Lady Duff Gordon. From this incredibly famous case, we will discuss implied promises and the use of those promises as consideration. In the process, we'll also talk about exclusive dealing contracts. Lucy Lady Duff Gordon, born Lucy Christiana Sutherland, was a famous and innovative British fashion designer whose company, Lucille Limited, served an impressive array of famous clients worldwide. And Otis F. Wood was a prominent New York advertising agent. By the way, uh, Lucy Lady Duff Gordon, she was also rather notorious. She sailed on the Titanic and she and her husband, Sir Cosmo, were both saved by a lifeboat. Think of her as kind of a Kardashian of her day. So in, in 1915, Wood and Lady Duff Gordon signed a year-long renewable contract whereby Wood was given the exclusive right to place Lady Duff Gordon's endorsement on other designs and the exclusive right to sell Lady Duff Gordon's own designs or license others to do so. These rights were all subject to Lady Duff Gordon's approval. The contract provided that the two parties would split equally all profits derived from this agreement. However, Lady Duff Gordon then began listing her products for sale in Sears Robux catalog. And you can see one of her advertisements right here. Wood alleged that she did so without informing him and withheld from him the profits from these Sears Robux catalogs. And Wood then sued for his share of these profits. So here's a quiz. Uh, the plaintiff argued that Lady Duff Gordon breached her contractual promise to Wood of exclusive dealing, of exclusivity, by endorsing products and earning money therefrom without the plaintiff's knowledge. And from the recital of facts you just heard, what did Wood promise in return to the plaintiff in exchange for this pr plaintiff promise of exclusivity? Well, the agreement gave Wood the exclusive right to do certain things, to place Duff Gordon's endorsement on others' designs and to market products and to grant licenses and, and prescribed Wood's conduct when doing those things. But it's not clear that the contractual terms actually required Woods to endorse, market, or license anything. It was just his option, so it wasn't clear what he was promising in exchange for Lady Duff Gordon's promise of exclusivity. That, indeed, was the basis of Lady Duff Gordon's defense. She argued that the party's agreement did not constitute an enforceable agreement because Wood did not bind himself to anything. The defendant argued, in other words, that the contract lacked consideration. The appellate division agreed, reversing the trial court judgment in favor of the plaintiff. Every promise on Wood's part, that court explained, was dependent upon him actually making endorsements, marketing Lady Duff Gordon's products, or granting licenses. And quote, nowhere in the contract has he bound himself to do any of these things. The monumentally famous judge, Benjamin Cardozo, who we already encountered in Jacob and Young's v. Kent, wrote the opinion for the New York Court of Appeals. You get a sense from this opinion of his ability to write memorable phrases, such as instinct with obligation. In this decision, Cardozo seemed to acknowledge that the literal words of the party's agreement did not convey any binding obligation on Wood's part. Yet, he asserted, that the law has outgrown its primitive stage of formalism when the precise word was sovereign talisman and every slip fatal. Even if a promise were not explicit, yet the whole writing may be instinct with an obligation, imperfectly expressed. Cardozo found this was the case in the agreement between Wood and Lady Duff Gordon. There was an imperfectly expressed or implied promise by Wood to, quote, use reasonable efforts to place the defendant's endorsements and market her design. How did Carzo Cardozo discern such an implied promise? Well, first, the fact that the right 
the defendant granted was exclusive, combined with the term of compensation set forth in the agreement, was extremely important. Cardozo insisted, quote, we are not to suppose that one party was to be placed in the mercy of another, unquote. If Lady Duff Gordon granted Wood the sole right to endorse products and market her designs, and Wood had no obligation to do anything in return, Lady Duff Gordon could derive no profit if Wood chose not to exercise his right. Rather, Cardozo argued, the acceptance of an exclusive deal agency was an assumption of its duties, a duty to make reasonable efforts. Additionally, the other terms of the contract illuminates the intention of the parties, and the intention supported a conclusion that the plaintiff also had an obligation under the agreement. Those terms included recognition that Woods was in the business of placing endorsements for, quote, the implication is that the plaintiff's business organization will be used for the purpose of for which it is adapted, unquote. Providing a monthly account of all the money Wood received and taking out all patents, copyrights, and trademarks as were necessary to protect the rights and goods the agreement affected. The implied promise to use reasonable efforts to bring profits and revenues into existence constituted consideration that created an enforceable agreement and allowed the plaintiff to recover for Lady Duff Gordon's breach. The holding of this case has essentially been codified as a default rule for exclusive dealing contracts in the Uniform Commercial Code. The UCC section 23062 reads, a lawful agreement by either the seller or the buyer for exclusive dealing, the kind of goods concerned, imposes, unless otherwise agreed, an obligation by the seller to use best efforts to supply the goods and by the buyer to use best efforts to promote their sale. And the official comment to this section says, subsection two on exclusive dealing makes explicit the commercial rule embodied in this act under which parties to such contracts are held to have impliedly, even when not expressly, bound themselves to use reasonable diligence as well as good faith in their performance of the contract. The exclusive agent is required, although no expressed commitment has been made, to use reasonable efforts and due diligence in the expansion of the market or the promotion of the product. We touched upon unconscionability earlier in the course when we discussed Williams versus Walker Thomas Furniture. Unconscionable contracts involve terms that are unreasonably favorable to one party. In that sense, there is a similarity between them and, the, and this contract, if we read it literally, uh, between Woods and Lady Duff Gordon. But note the important difference. Unconscionable contracts, though one-sided, pre present mutual obligations and courts decline to enforce them because they were forged through an unfair procedure that led to unfair results. By contract, the one-sided contract at issue here, in this case of Lady Duff Gordon, uh, appeared to lack mutuality, but the court rendered the contract less one-sided by reading into it an implied obligation of reasonable effort. Cardozo apparently felt that the one-sidedness was not a product of procedural defect, but merely an imperfect expression of the actual exchange promises. Reading these two different kinds of cases together teaches that courts have two starkly different ways of responding to one-sidedness, uh, either by refusing to enforce them or by making them, more one, uh, by making them less one-sided by finding implied uh, uh, return promises as consideration. As we've already mentioned, Cardozo's opinion reversed the decision of the appellate division, which unanimously agreed it, quote, quite apparent that the defendant gives everything and the plaintiff nothing, and there is a lack of mutuality in the contract. Indeed, Cardozo's own court was split 4-3. Why can't parties to exclusive dealing contracts simply include good faith or reasonable effort clauses into their agreements if they want to have them uh, clothed with consideration? Wouldn't that obviate the need for implied promises?